Hey, we're all about baseball. Goops, of course, with the uh, Angels telecast. I'm with the Mariners. Boog does ESPN national radio and TV. The big news that came out last night about the folks at uh, the Players Association, MLB, I'm talking about starting baseball back up in May in Arizona. Your thoughts. Uh, let, Mark, start with you. What do you think? Well, you know, I was reading that last night. And I'll tell you, all of a sudden, my heart started beating again. It's almost like I was back in going to spring training, whether to play or doing what I'm doing now as a broadcaster. The excitement level was there. I, I know right. there's a lot of issues still to be, you know, ironed out. Right. And, and it's not going to be easy. But just the thought, every once in a while, and I've always believed this growing up and where I grew up in Philly, and uh, it's always been, if, if you take away hope, what do you have? And, and, and all of a sudden, right. I got that hope in my, in my mind going, Hey, maybe, you know, with, with baseball coming back, we've seen what baseball has done throughout history as far as this country, as far as bringing everyone together and giving somebody just a little respite for what's going on in the world. That, uh, you know, like I said, it's going to be very difficult. If they do, it'll be start almost like a mini spring training once again in May. Yeah. And then probably I would imagine they would start games in June. And it's not – we remember in 95 when we had that shortened spring training. Everyone said, how are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? Nobody remembers, you know, that spring training would be in so quick. Everyone got their work in. These guys are in great shape anyhow right now. They had a partial spring training. There's no way they just all of a sudden to stop. They're, they're continuing <laughs> yeah, on. Right. So uh, I think they'll be ready to go if indeed. And I think it is as crazy as it sounds and, 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 you know, as happy as it would make everybody, it would be really, really good if it happened. Boog, your thoughts. I have so many thoughts. I, yeah, I, I hear you. I mean, again, it, it it, like Gooby said, that the hope, you know, starts to, to gurgle up. And that part is, is really cool. Logistically, it would just seem like a nightmare. Um, there are so many loose ends that they would have to figure out. You know, my guess is that it'd be something they'd really be working with the government and you'd need probably some type of military participation to figure out. I mean, just to, even something as far as, okay, where do they stay? Who cleans those rooms? And then the people that cleans the room, are they allowed back out of their community? I mean, all that type of stuff. I will tell you this, and I'm not I, – I, I think the two things are, from a public health standpoint, I don't think you can do this until public testing on a fast level at large is available. Like, you can't do it for baseball so that guys are constantly able to be tested, and we're all in that pod being tested – and the public at large can't get their hands on tests. Right. So there'd be that. And then the one thing I would say from a, a baseball standpoint that's just real, fellas, contemplate this for a second. This is a moment that baseball could possibly have. I don't know that it's ever going to get another chance like this again. I'm not saying that and suggesting to risk anything, but I'm simply saying if we're honest with ourselves and you look at baseball and the popularity and that type of thing for where we are in the middle of this, if baseball were to come back and play and the only be the only thing out there, it's something that could really be an amazing thing for the sport and for the country. Yeah, that would be a huge positive. There's no question. I'm, I'm just concerned. I think, as you mentioned, the people come in to clean a room and Goops, you know, like when we travel, let's say we have a traveling party, 75. So now everybody's get tech. Got to get tested every day. I mean, you got the people on the plane who are flying you there. As, as yeah. Boog was talking about, the people have to feed us and keep us clean and all that stuff. There's so many – and the ticket takers, the camera guys, all the production crew and the TV. That's a lot, man. That yeah, is a, I, I think yeah. – the one thing about baseball as far as we talk about separation and social distancing, baseball probably is the one sport where you don't have a lot of real close contact. Right. Other than, than that home plate area where you have the catcher. And, you know, and holding the runner at first, umpires. too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, again, if you don't have a good pickoff move, there's a good separation of about 12 feet <laughs> by that point when I'm on the mound. <laughs> but they are – talking. I mean, at the plate, they are talking about, you know, the robot umpires that they wouldn't sit in dugouts, that they'd sit in the stands and they'd be socially distanced. And then the next issue becomes, if you're playing the whole thing in Arizona, fellas, it's hot. Oh, yeah. so, oh. so sitting in the stands, you know, with in the dugout, there's covering. When the stands, there's not covering. I, again, these are all things that they'd have to sort out, and I'm and I'm sure they. But there's just a lot to get to, and I think that the public health and the player health component is, yeah. uh, you know, is the first thing. 
Goops, what do you think the players are? I mean, the majority, if you were to speak for the players, and it's Tony Clark's job, I get that. But, you know, as a player, if you were among the group, you know, what, what are you thinking right now? Uh, you know, if you're, you've been, you've been keeping sort of busy, ready to jump yeah. in, and now we're talking about possibly going to get it in a few weeks. I think How effective thing, could you I, be? Yeah, I mean, I, I think first thing you think about is your family, your family being there. I mean, this, if you're going to be in Arizona for a month before everyone else in around the country, the government feels better about people going into their home stadium. I know in California here, Gavin Newsom has already said it might not be a possibility till August, September rains, if then. Yeah. So, so you're possibly being out there in Arizona for four months, four and a half months or more. So how, do, how does that work out? I, that's, I always, family is always the most important thing, but right. as far as, then you, if you get beyond that, everything's comfortable with that. Uh, this, I, the baseball, even in spring training games, I know none of them count, but you can tell everybody at the plate, everybody on the mound, everybody on the field is playing this game as if it, it means something. You don't want to be the guy that they talk about in those morning newspapers that gave up 10 runs and it didn't get a third because <laughs> we used to do that all the time in Kansas City. All right, who had the best line of the day? Or if you're a batter and you all of a sudden you got, you know, you got struck out two or three times in a row, right. you weren't even fouling the ball off. One thing I will know is there'll be some incredible numbers in Arizona because that baseball will be flying. Oh. The ground will oh. be so hard. that Anything on the ground will be flying through. So you better have the ability to get a swing and miss out there in Arizona if it's possible. I don't think people realize that. You know, we, I, you talk to pitching coaches and the distinction between spring training in Arizona, spring training in Florida – and the pitching coach is like Arizona at times, it can be a little bit of a, a nightmare trying to sort out, okay, what's really happening here? Yeah. Yeah. And, and oh, if yeah. you're infielder, back up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. Hey, let's switch, yeah. uh, switch scenarios for a second. And we call this announcers on. And I want to get to like the backstory of guys and how they got into business. Uh, Goops, you, play, you played, you, you grew up in Philly listening to some of the guys I grew up listening to. And, and then as a player, you had a great career, won a ring with Kansas City. How did you get into broadcast? You know, I'll tell you, I don't know if I've ever told anybody this story, Boog, and, and Simsy, how crazy and bizarre it, it came about. So I'm, I'm literally in Las Vegas for Super Bowl weekend because I went with my family and friends every single Super Bowl weekend. Right. I get a call on my cell phone from ESPN, as a matter of fact, asking, hey, would you be willing to come in and do an audition for our baseball tonight show? I'm like, oh, sure. And then they go, well, could you be here like, like now? And I'm like, <laughs> I said, I, I don't know if you want me there now. I might have, uh, I might have lost a few hands on the blackjack table, so maybe you might not want me in there now. And said, well, if you can't make it now, then we'll have to move on. And I said, well, you know, maybe it wasn't meant to be. So then, out of, out of nowhere, a month later, Fox Sports called me up with a similar thing. I'm thinking, how did they get my cell phone number? I don't even know. And so I went and did an audition with Steve Sachs and Ron Darling and a few other people, and uh, I'm sitting. I'd never had any experience whatsoever other than playing like I was Harry Callis or Richie Ashburn or one of the guys back Here's in the day. two two pitch <laughs> yeah oh Michael <laughs> Jack Schmidt and then and then I, I did this thing so all I remember is looking I'm like wait a minute there's four cameras around here I'm like and I think I better look for the one with that little red dot on so I kind of moved my head around like that they, I did the audition and then they go hey we'll call you back and it, it might my father-in-law was in, in, the, in the movie business he goes oh you got the old proverbial we'll call you back for and I said oh hey. yeah so then that night they called me because you ready to do we're going to do four live shows every day five days a week it's going to be called baseball today show i'm like uh okay and <laughs> lo and behold i drove in there and started doing that and then i did my own radio show for a while and then, then the angels asked me if i would be willing to do uh, 50 games originally with jose mo and i'm like hello this would be the greatest <laughs> gig in the world and lo and behold here i am now 14 years later doing the same thing which i had no idea i was going to do but i tell you i love every moment Good for you, man. That's awesome. Book, how'd you get started, man? I, you know, I initially, I wanted to be, um, I wanted to be Coleman and the Soul Man. I wanted to do sports talk. Great. I did, man. So I'm a New York City kid, and I went down to Miami, and I did sports talk radio, and I started to get bored with it. And the one sport, even though it was my passion, my love, that I had never really done play-by-play -play for was baseball. So I went and started doing games into a, a tape recorder in an empty press box in 94 and 95. And eventually I gave the tape to someone and they offered me a, a job to go do the Boise Hawks, Angels affiliate. Tom Kochman was the manager, Casey's dad. 
Um, and I did that. And then when I came back, the Marlins were changing up their broadcast crew and they needed a guy to travel to do pre and post in-game scores and maybe a tiny bit of play-by-play. And I just – I got really lucky, and I just kind of, you know, built from there. Good for you, man. <clears throat> you mentioned Coleman man and a soul man. I, I was the soul man. It was a black and white. It was like the mod squad. Eddie Coleman, a white Irish guy from Boston. Put the black guy from Philly, put them together. Coleman man and a soul man. I did that for, for like three, four years. But prior to that, uh, when I was a little Bethany College out in West Virginia, I did, uh, I did basketball and football play-by-play. First baseball game I did was an MSG. It was a, uh, a St. John's game. Oh, wow. And then I did some games in 93, 94 with uh, ESPN. And one time in 04, 05, I was out in Seattle, did a game. And one thing led to another. And uh, a friend of my brother-in-law and then Ron Fraley retired. They called me, put it, put it in my bid and put on my tape. And here I am. I'm 14 years in too, Goop. So it's uh, – hey, hey, guys, real quick. Don't you think, though, if anybody's ever getting into this business, I think getting it on the radio side was the best thing for me oh. that I ever did. Cause, cause you don't have on the TV side, you always have so many, it's more structured on the radio side. Hey, I was cutting tapes, setting up interviews, doing all these things, highlights. And I'm thinking, I don't know how to do this stuff, but you learned how to do it. And that was the thing. I learned how to do all these things. Not to be, not be my own boss, but also, but, but basically know how to do everything. Cause Skill you know set, baby. Goes, guys, yeah, yeah. When the people in the truck start telling you something, well, they know it because they've been, been there, done that, and lived it. But they're not the ones that, when, they're, when you're on the air, are going to look bad. You're going to look bad if everything's going wrong. But you also realize as a team, you can't do it without that team in there as far as that truck. That's the beauty of being a jock, too. And, and Boog, you, and I think that's a great point. And I, I remember uh, to, what Gooby's talking about, learning the mechanical stuff. For me, transitioning from a newspaper writer when I got out of college, and I did seven years at the Daily News here in New York, but doing talk radio to your point goops about, you know, you, you got to think on your feet. You're talking to a whole bunch of people interviewing a wide spectrum of folks. And I think that that's been unbelievably helpful uh, to me. But what about you? Yeah. The radio component is helpful to me. I think, you know, both you guys can attest, especially the, the talk radio stuff. And there go some of those sirens. Yeah, I know. Um, no, I just heard that. Man. No. The talk radio stuff. I think it allows you to um, to think on your feet. You know, you're working without a net, you know. So if you're doing a show and you don't have callers or what, you know, you've got to generate topics and you've got to be able to think on your feet. And I, it always, that, that sort of anchor, that base served me when I transitioned into TV. And now I get to do both. And I love the fact that I, that I get to do both. But Isn't that great? To be able to do both. I mean, it's, I, I always say oh, it's apples and hand grenades. I mean, because when you're on TV groups, you're doing, you're doing captions. But in radio, Boog, hey, man, where's the wind blowing? And Marty Glickman, I, I was a Marty Glickman disciple. And I worked with him when he was in MSG and M- NB- NBC Sports in the late 80s. David, I want you to tell me what it looks like, <clears throat> what it sounds like, what it smells like, and I want every movement. Where is his hands? If he's a left-hand hitter, is, are his hands high or his hands low? I mean, he said, give me every detail yeah. possible. Don't script. And the other thing, too, and Gooby, I mean, you, you appreciate this, is that when you're doing it on the radio, you're trying to activate the picture in the person's mind. So when Trout comes up, <laughs> I'll say big right-handed hitter digs in. Yeah, I know everybody knows he's right-handed, but when I say it, it activates that they're picturing him getting in and, and, and those types of things that people may know, but there are these verbal cues. And, you know, Excellent. when you when you nail a big play on the radio, it's, it's so cool because the words spill out. You paint that picture and TV access is a, a different skill set, but I, I love that I get to do both. I feel so lucky to be able to do both. Yeah, you're, you're basically an artist when you're on the radio. You're painting that picture. We all know playing stickball or playing poop in the <laughs> schoolyard, every, everything you're doing is exactly what you heard on the radio saying, oh, you know, you know I used to love Fake McBride. I loved him. He had that, that short <laughs> body. He's up there right? like that. I'm like, sure. I'm Fake McBride. I said, but I'm swinging right-handed, but I, I figured out a way to be able to make it look exactly just – from a right-handed stance is compared to a left-handed stance. So, but listening in radio, I mean, it felt like you were there. Yeah. TV, you're basically, I remember one of the best advice I ever got on the TV side, 
don't tell me the obvious. Tell me what you might have thought that hitter or pitcher were doing in that process. On the radio side, you're painting that picture all the way right. through. The other thing, too, I like you know, for TV, um, gives you a broad canvas to first guess. Yeah. I mean, you know, as a po- on radio, you got a little bit more time. I mean, you want to say it's happening here. But on TV, there's so much, so many gaps that are there that you can first guess. If you're wrong, so what? But you're going to hit a few, too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Cool. I think, yeah, you, when you look at that, too, I always look for me when I'm doing a game and get first guessing. I'm looking. You can read body language. And I did oh. that all the time in the dugout. And I right. did that when I was on the mound, too. I knew when a hitter absolutely owned me. I also knew, I mean, it could be the, one of the greatest hitters ever at the plate. I could see his feet. I could see the way he's moving his hands. I got him. But, like, Don Manning's at the plate. I could be throwing 1,000 miles an hour. He's just sitting there going, I got you. I own you. I don't care where you throw the ball. I'm going to get a base hit. And generally, he did. When I, I'm going to have to look up those numbers. No, 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 no. <laughs> When I started at ESPN, uh, Steve Stone did a year there. And, and one of his good – cheat sheet recommendations that I would notice that he would do is he'd be looking down in the dugout after a pitcher. So he'd be looking and a pitcher had been, you know, given up a couple of runs and he'd look and he'd look and he'd, you know, the camera would be on the field and he'd say, this probably be a good time for the pitching coach to go out to the mound. And he'd already <laughs> see the pitching coach start up the stuff. Oh, that's a great one. The, you know, a little, little, little cheat sheet. That's, that's good stuff. Yeah. Hey, right Goops, there. you got to use that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Believe me. I, like I said, you can all, already tell. I mean, you can see when a pitcher gives that one deep breath where he's like, it's either like a confident one or one you're like, uh oh, he's hoping he's, he's looking at the corner of his eye like, hey, did they get somebody up in the bullpen yet? Hey, <laughs> let me ask you like, guys as broadcasters, I, well, do you remember the, I'll tell you mine, but do you remember the first time or did, how do you, you got to meet Harry Callis? Oh, yeah. my God. Real quick, uh, uh, 99, 2000, I'm doing the Phillies Sunday, the Phillies Weekly, the pregame show. The second year, they had me go in and do in-game interviews. And I'll never forget, it was, uh, and Harry goes, top of the sixth inning here at the vet. Giants lead the Phillies three to two. And standing by with a special guest is Dave Sims. Dave, and I went, Holy mackerel, he knows my name. <laughs> Harry freaking Callis was a, you know, he's a god in Philly, you know. I thought that was, that, that blew me away. That, that, to this yeah, day, I still yo, get chills. Oh, it was incredible. I, like, I, I had his ringtone there when the Phillies won the World Series in, 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 in 2008. The Phillies are the world champions. I had that as my ringtone forever. So we're doing a game. I'm with Rory Marcus, who has passed away himself. So we're, it's Rory and myself doing the game. Harry comes over and does an inning with us. No so way. he sits down, and you know me, you, you both know me, I, I generally can never stop talking. So I'm like, I'm looking, I'm like, oh, my. He goes, hey, Mark, I remember you at Penn Charter High School. And I'm like, oh, my. Oh, you know, you know wow. me, you know me. And so I'm sitting there for that, that inning, I'm thinking, wow, that was the greatest. And, and lo and behold, both passed away Ooh, that very yeah. next year. But I, but I think just to have that one opportunity, one inning to say, I actually worked along Harry Kals was the greatest thrill of my life. And I'll tell you what, I, I have goosebumps. I get the I got in, had many interviews with Vince Scully, who again was one of the greatest is oh, one yeah. of the greatest human beings. His ever. eminence and his voice, but to do it with with Harry too as well, and do an interview with Vince Scully. I said, you know what, I'm good, I'm all good. Yeah, and I, of course, hanging with you guys, which is always the best. Hey, hey. <laughs> Brooke, what about you? That, that's a great question. So I got I got to interview him a couple of times, and I was always struck by while I was interviewing him, it always felt like I was for my part of it always felt like. So, Harry, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's how it felt, right? Totally, to totally. Him. And, but, but this is true. This, this is going to sound like a bit, but it's true. It was 1995, and I was um, at Dolphin Pro Player, Joe Robbie Stadium, whatever they were calling it then. <laughs> I was online and for food, and – um I wasn't paying attention, and the Marlins are playing the Phillies, and uh, so I, w- I just I wasn't really paying attention. And the guy in front of me orders, and I hear, "I'll have some lasagna, little <laughs> salad on the spot." <laughs> and I was like, and then I, so then I tapped him and introduced myself. But I was, yeah, he was ahead of me in line in the food line, and uh, you know, I had to explain to him that I was. Uh, yeah, that I was a 
diehard fan and that is yeah. a great story yeah it, then it, it, it like it totally it like shocked your entire system right oh my because i was not i wasn't looking yeah so, so i heard the voice the voice was the first thing that i heard it was just it was amazing unbelievable well boys we've uh, run through pretty much the, almost 30 minutes and it thoroughly enjoyed way, it. Guys, we gotta do this again have, you both have great voices that's what i always listen to as a as a sports fan and I, I i love all sports i always know when you guys are on the air well, i appreciate and I hear that your voices. that's I and mean, i tell you what that's what i love about it. i go Boop. well first of all i go they're my boys yeah like, right man it's it's so incredible when when you know people have that voice where you just stop and you know who it is and yeah. it makes it better when you're friends with them absolutely you know it and, and think okay wait a yeah, minute i can't wait you, for this one moment like, they're gonna say something i'm gonna remember you say you get it like that simsy are you like me like, I'm looking at Gooby's office, and I just want to jump through the screen and wander <laughs> around and see what's going on back there. Like, I want Dude, to see who hit, who I hit this bomb home. off of you, right? <laughs> yeah. I want, like, I, you know, what's going on over there? Oh, what's that? <laughs> Whose speakers are those? Show me this baseball. What's that ball? What's that trophy? Yeah. Guy, forever, I was always so quiet and shy about asking, like, remember the old, good old days, but at the old-timer games? So, oh, like, God, you kidding me? I, like, oh, Willie Mays, man. I got an autograph. Oh. I got Al K. Yeah. Line, because I remember, because he passed wow. away yesterday. All these people, Hank Aaron, Lou Brock, Bob Gibson, Don Drysdale, Joe DiMaggio, Mickey Mantle, I got all their autographs. Oh, wow. By, by going, hey, uh, will you sign? Oh, sure, anything, anything yeah. for you. But I also got some rock and roll stuff, too, that you guys would love, too. I Joe guess, D, I, gotta, you, you're yeah. I know you got to, we got to go, but uh, Joe D, when Mickey died in what, 95, 96, and Joe D was still very much alive, I was at Channel 2 here in New York, and I had a camera crew, and they knew Joe was in town. I literally chased him all over town. I finally get him in the catacombs of old Yankee Stadium. Mr. DiMaggio, I'd just like to get a comment. I'm scared to death, and I'm already in the business like 15 years. I'm like, this is Joe freaking D, man. It's my old man's hero. Mr. Mr. DiMaggio, uh, can I get a comment? Uh, uh, on Mickey's passing, I mean, I said it on Mickey's passing is, my, you're a persistent young man. I wet my pants. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> unbelievable, man. Hey, it's been a pleasure. Look forward to doing it again. Yeah. Announcers on. I'm Dave Sims, Book Shambi, Mark Gubaza. Boys, all the best. Thanks a lot. Peace out, guys. Peace.